Welcome uh, to Pen & Brush. For any of you who have not been here, I'm Dawn Delicat, the Associate Executive Director, and this is Janice Sands, our Executive Director. For those of you who may not know, Pen & Brush is a 125-year-old organization dedicated to under-recognized women artists and writers. <laughs> Thank you, yes, it, it is absolutely amazing. Um, we bet that our founders never thought it would still be needed in 2019, sadly, but here we are together um, to keep at it and keep the dialogue going. So the exhibition around you is an example of what we do to help expose under-recognized artists. We do have a few superstars in the room. Jean Shin is one who's above you, Martha Wilson's downstairs, Marin Hassinger, Linda Stein. Uh, and th those women are graciously showing in solidarity to kind of bring attention to all the under-recognized women who are on the walls next to them. So if you have any questions about our exhibit, all work is for sale. 75% goes straight to the artist. 25 comes back in to feed our work here at Pen & Brush. We also publish a journal for writers. We have a reading tomorrow night. So if any of you are readers or into poetry, please... Um, Check out our journal on the desk or come to one of our readings the first Wednesday of every month. And if you have any questions about our work here, you can find us at the desk. So without further ado, I will give you Janice Sands. Thank you. Uh, it's for the women on the walls, actually. Um, it's wonderful to see this room filled with as many people as are in here tonight. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a celebration over and over again of women and their triumphs, uh, which are so hard to come by. Um, I was reading um, from uh, the catalog that you have put together, which is a beautiful piece, and it struck me immediately that so much of the narrative there is our narrative. There's, there's almost no difference. It's, it's, a, it's a tale about under-recognition, women using names that are not their own so that nobody would know that a piece of work was done by a female. Um, Pen & Brush has experienced all of these things and realized over the years that to be successful it had to do uh, a couple of things that I think you all have done too. One of them is to create a community where women feel supported um, and their work is recognized at least by their, by their cohort. I also think that if we're ever going to make any real uh, progress, um, and we have, we have made a lot, I like to think that um, that women of pen and brush in 1894 said you just wait we're going to work for suffrage for women and when we finally get the right to vote things will change no <laughs> so clearly we all have a lot of work to do but um i think that what it's going to take actually is for organizations um like the AAA and and you all being part of that as women and coming together as women and our organization and many others out there uh, to come together. We need, among many other things, the sheer weight and force of all of our efforts together uh, for us to really um, find a place for visual artists and in our case also uh, for uh, the writers of poetry and literary fiction. Uh, we do publish um, those, those works as well as uh, provide places for the visual artists to be exhibited. Because we think it's important actually to create, um, and I, I think there's something that you all do that's comparable to this, to create a kind of a repository, an archive of the work. Um, it is critical that that, that work not be lost. Um, we can't show every female artist or publish every female writer. But what we can do is archive their work, um, which does many things. It preserves it, makes it available for people to read it. It also provides provenance so that at any point in the future um, that, that can be looked up and it's a, it's a registry, which I think is terribly important. A lot of the work is, is lost over time. So we're doing what we can um, to see that that doesn't happen. I think you all are doing that to make sure that it doesn't happen for, uh, for women who have been working in abstract art. So that's what I have to say. Welcome. I think we have a great panel. Um, it's going to be really interesting to hear what everybody has to say. And I'll give you back to Dawn, who will get you started. Okay. I'd like to introduce um, my 
comrade in uh, concocting this <laughs> event tonight. Um, I'm so glad that she did uh, approach me and we got this night together. So Joanne Freeman, who's the vice president of AAA. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to our event, Beyond the Gendered, Gendered Lens, from the AA exhibition, Blurring Boundaries, to a larger discussion of women in contemporary art. I've already been introduced, I'm Joanne Freeman. Um, and first and foremost, I would like to thank our wonderful host this evening, Pen and Brush. I would like to thank Elizabeth Redfield, Parker Daly, Janice Sands, and a very special thanks to Dawn, who went well, far beyond making this possible. Um, and thank you for raising this sculpture so that we could fit more seats. Um, I'd like to thank Jim Osman, our president, Ann Rusinoff and Liz Ainsley on publicity and communications. Thank you to Emily Berger, Creighton Michael, and the curator Rebecca Gio De Giovanna for creating the currently touring exhibition, Blurring Boundaries, the women of AAA, 1936 to the present. And of course, a very special thank you to our guest panelists, Virginia Anderson, Nancy P Prinsenthal, and Karen Wilkin. So, um, we're going to get right to the questions. Uh, the first one is for Rebecca Di Giovanna, who is our curator of Blurring Boundaries. Um, some artists and critics argue that gender-based shows encourage tokenism and ghettoize women artists. Others, of course, say that after a long history of shows featuring only men, this is a necessary corrective. So. Rebecca, we'd like to know what your thoughts are on the subject, tokenism or corrective? Hello. Okay. Um, I think it's an interesting question because uh, I think back to, you know, my personal experience uh, when we were initially in the planning stages of uh, discussing this show and reaching out to members as a call and um, we did receive you know some hesitation or even refusal for some who did not want to participate based off of these very ideas that maybe it was you know othering in some sort of way um, there was an expression that uh, maybe because individually they hadn't experienced inherent sexism in the art world, maybe this show wasn't necessary. And that stigma and that fear is something that I, I understand um, and I don't necessarily, don't necessarily disagree with. Um, but I think it's important too to look toward the larger picture and understand kind of the context of the time that we're living in, um, where we're very much trying to reconstruct a historical narrative that um, has been overtly male um, and we are actively trying to correct discrepancies in um, not only our history, but in museum staffing and museum collections. Um, and I think a very revealing state of affairs is just looking at institutional announcements from this past month where um, the Guggenheim, for instance, just announced that they've hired their first full-time black female curator, or you have the BMA who has just started their 2020 initiative uh, to only collect uh, female identifying artists. And so I think the fact that we're celebrating those kinds of milestones still in 2019 um, is kind of a very good indicator of why these kinds of shows are still um, necessary. And I think any exhibition that provides a platform for uh, conversation that's critical and is in a safe environment is going to be constructive. Um, and in the case of Blurring Boundaries, um, I think it's important to note that we never really conceived this show to discuss any sort of kind of feminist stratagem as it will. Um, it was and is always about abstraction at its core and it's, it's supposed to elucidate an intergenerational conversation between past and present members within an organization that has always qualified its membership based on 
uh, their ability to use abstraction rather than through their gender. We're going to get to you in just a minute, <clears throat> excuse me, to hear about your show and uh, your, um, your initiative for your museum. But before we do, um, I'd like to ask Emily Berger, who is an artist in Blurring Boundaries, um, to talk a little bit uh, about this issue of gender. Does working in abstraction Relying on formal structures and non-objective content remove the issue of gender? And, and I realize you're speaking just for you and not for an entire sex. Does abstraction take work beyond the gendered lens? And to what extent does the creative artist experience herself as gendered or not? Initially, my reaction was um, no or yes, or I have no idea. And then I had to think, really think about it. So I'm sorry, you'll have to forgive me. I wrote down a few things because um, otherwise I, I won't remember. So my first thing, my first question, it's a question in answer to your question, which is for the artist or the viewer. I think there's a big difference. There's a sense of freedom and abstraction from notions of gender in that less is revealed sexually, personally, politically, socially than in representational work. Of course, some artists deal explicitly with gender in their work. Otherwise, I tend to think that it does not enter in much in terms of how we consider our own work. I think part of the motivation for becoming an artist is the freedom from convention, socially, the way you live, freedom in your work. We don't walk around thinking of ourselves as women artists. We think of ourselves as artists. It's how we are per perceived that makes a difference in our careers, how our work is interpreted, and sometimes in our self-esteem, unfortunately. In terms of how we may be seen and treated, abstraction is no protection in the sense that we cannot escape the associations with certain qualities in an art that can be gendered, materials, techniques, colors, shapes, etc., that are considered masculine or feminine, despite our desire for freedom from stereotyping. This is an anecdote. This is the <laughs> from my past, my deep past. I had a well-known professor at Skowhegan who looked at one of my paintings and saw it through a gendered lens right away. Though it was abstract, it was a painting of overlapping regular marks in a range of warm colors, reds, oranges, etc. His comment was that women, because of all those lipsticks, had a good grasp of the variety of these colors. This is true. <laughs> Even then, I knew it was a ridiculous reference, but on the other hand, I've never forgotten it. And that kind of thing makes you think twice about the kind of color you use and other things, like you're not in the conversation, really. You're in some other conversation. The women's room, where the conversation is about lipstick, where what is considered traditionally feminine is second class. So you can try and ignore it, or you can embrace it, or reject it, but really on some level you have to engage it or acknowledge it. Sorry, I'm reading. <laughs> Did I laugh? Not at that age, no. <laughs> I think I just stood there. You know, what do you say? And the thing is, he was a really nice guy. He was a sweet. He was a sweetheart. He just didn't know what he. He didn't know what he was talking about. I mean, that's that's part of what makes things difficult, right? You have these personal relationships with people, and then they say these things to you. One more personal anecdote, and I want to to um, remind you that in those good old days, I did not have one female professor in studio art. I was welding. I loved it. I loved the whole manual labor aspect of, the, of it, the helmet, the mask, the gloves, the sparks. Because I'm a human being, it was fun and empowering. 
My, prof my professor took a look at my sculpture and drawled, well, I guess you could be a lady welder. I knew that was trivializing. I knew he meant it as an insult and the feminine as a slur. Clearly, I was first and foremost a girl. The sculpture was irrelevant. But those were the bad old days. I believe that historically, as a modern movement in the West, abstraction represented a new freedom for artists, and therefore, more women felt free to participate, and in some places, like in AAA, were also accepted as equals more readily. It was new, and it was freeing for everyone. In Blurring Boundaries, we wanted to showcase women because, as women, we've been pushed aside, neglected, and forgotten, not in AAA. In fact, one of the significant aspects of AEA is the prominent and now equal participation of women in its history, as you saw in the presentation and as Rebecca mentioned. The artist, the artist Alice Adams, who with painter Jane Logeman suggested some time ago that we do a Women of AEA exhibition, wrote a wonderful essay for the Blurring Boundaries catalog, which you can read, with a telling anecdote. She was asked to judge two landscape gardens and to guess which was the woman's and which was the man's. She said she could tell the difference right away. The one that clearly cost more to make was the man's. <laughs> Virginia, this next question is for you. The Baltimore Museum of Art has announced a year-long vision initiative for 2020 to celebra cel celebrate female identifying artists. Can you tell us some of the thinking behind this initiative and in turn how your show by their creative force, American Women Modernists, came to fruition and also what do you mean by female identifying artists? Let me know if you can't hear me. Um, you can hear me? Yes? Okay, good. Um, so 2020 vision, uh, initially, you know, it's been in the planning stages for a couple of years. And it was in thinking about the, of course, centennial of women's suffrage. Um, and wanting to mark that with some kind of an exhibition. And initially it started off as an exhibition and then it became um, really a museum-wide initiative. Uh, so it really grew to a group of exhibitions, a series of programming, and then as we announced recently, really thinking about acquisitions and the impact that we can have on our collection. And um, that was really, you know, just sort of thinking about, it's a, it's a one year focus on acquiring works by women artists uh, through purchase. And we know it won't change everything, but we hope it will change something. Um, we know there's a lot of uh, room to, to catch up on. Um, so the initiative was really pushed in a museum wide direction by the president of our board of trustees, Claire Siegel, and uh, she really sort of you know, said, let's take this to, to a museum wide um, place. Um, and I think, you know, as we were thinking about it uh, recently, we became grateful and cognizant of the strong history of women directors, curators, and collectors that have really shaped the history of the museum. Um, our first director, uh, Florence Nightingale Levy, was a woman. Um, she founded the museum. And she was the director from 1923 to 1926. Um, Adeline Breeskin was a formative curator and the director of the museum from 1942 to 1962. Uh, most recently, we had Doreen Bulger, who was there from 98 to 2015. So between you know the series of really impactful directors and then, of course, the Cone Collection, really, right, if you think about our wonderful collection of modernist art was put together by two sisters, um, Dr. Clara Bell and her sister, Etta Cohn. Um, and the two of them really, you know, traveling and, and acquiring these amazing works by Matisse and Picasso, among others. Um, so, you know, that, I think that impact and really thinking about that history uh, is one that we want to acknowledge and be mindful of as well. Um, I guess I can also talk about the exhibition. So I'm relatively new to the museum. I've been there for about 15 months. 
And when I came on board, this initiative was already in place. Um, I got to know the collection, I got to see our, um, what we had on view, and then of course, right, the joy as a curator is that you get to go into storage, and you get to see what's behind the scenes as well as what is, at least at the moment, on view. Um, and I realized really that we had some wonderful pieces, both already on view and that, you know, it would be great to bring out from the vaults. And so the concept of this exhibition came together. Um, the show focuses on works by American women artists, work and the works themselves date from around 1915 to around 1955. So it's a very, fairly eclectic presentation. Um, I want to, you know, really the title, I guess, maybe too, would be important to address. We were think in thinking about how, what do we title an exhibition like this? Of course, when you think about modernism, you, in, in some ways, um, come to Virginia Woolf, right? And thinking about a, a room of one's own. But um, that was a little too evident. Uh, but when you read through A Room of One's Own, she has this wonderful passage, which is actually very appropriate for the location we find ourselves in tonight, in which she talks about how women have been so contained for so long, women's creative energies have been so pent up for so long that by their creative force, they must needs burst through these walls with pens and brushes um, and business and politics. So right, all of those forces coming out um, together. And when we sort of thought about that quote, it seemed that by their creative force was really kind of a great you know, championing phrase for this exhibition, a very timely um, in thinking about the turn of the century and the first you know, 40 or 50 years thereafter. Um, yeah. And Gertrude Stein. And Gertrude Stein, sure, as, a, as an author, you mean, or? Oh, of course. Well, of course, as a woman artist and a woman collector, yes, very much so. I mean, the cones would not have been the cones if it weren't for Gertrude Stein, right? Or Sarah. Or Sarah. And we have um, Sadie May, uh, Blanche Adler. I mean, really, you know, I could go on. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long and rich history. <laughs> go on, she says, go on. Yes. Virginia, one, one more quick question. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think this year-long initiative will impact how the museum goes forward? Um, I think that's a terrific question. I've, I've already begun to see it come into play, right? I mean, obviously, for the exhibitions that we have planned for next year, by their creative forces, the first show that opens up, um, I have another exhibition that I'm installing next week uh, called Freeform, which focuses on mid-century craft by a small group of women artists. Um, we have just a whole spring series of exhibitions that will be opening up. I mean, it really is uh, museum-wide. Our entire contemporary wing is going to be rehung with a group of solo exhibitions in the spring and then another group of solo exhibitions in the fall. Um, so as we're planning these exhibitions, uh, we are being mindful not only of next year, but also the years to come, right? As you know, museums plan their exhibitions several years out, so we're already paying attention to the balance and representation in our planned exhibitions. Um, for the next few years as we look ahead. Um, and then also in terms of acquisitions, being mindful, uh, you know, as always, it's, it's a balance between artistic excellence and social equity. And, right, you're looking at the, at the art, you know, anything that comes to mind, whether it's a gift or whether it's a purchase, you're always keeping in mind those two kind of factors. So trying to balance those together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Karen, let's continue with you. In your essay, Beyond the Sea, written for Art and Antiques magazine in 2013, you write, plainly we categorize Frank and Thaler, of course Helen, uh, at our peril. Far from being identified, uh, far from being defined by a single early painting, she resists easy labels. The only identifying title she herself ever accepted was painter, always refusing the qualifying adjective woman. Of course, no qualifiers were necessary since she was not only as good as any of her male colleagues of her generation, but better than most. It's time to look beyond mountains and sea. Can you elaborate on how her work was received by audiences and critics in her day? and how that narrative has evolved in relation to current attitudes toward gender and identity. Um, 
when Frank Teller first started showing, uh, there was enthusiasm for the energy of her work, and many uh, very significant people took it very seriously, uh, including Clement Greenberg. Uh, she showed uh, Adolf Gottlieb uh, selected a work of hers uh, for a show at Coots Gallery, where artists that showed at Coots chose people. And she was fresh out of Bangton at the time. And when she started exhibiting more regularly, uh, where she was starting to stain and doing uh, paintings that were as uh, often as delicate in color as Mountains and Sea, uh, that was sometimes seen uh, by critics as feminine, um, pretty. Uh, there's been a certain amount of recent stupidity about that, where uh, women critics have said, well, she, she was a feminist without knowing it because she made it all right to make pretty pictures. Um, Helen never, never made a pretty picture in her life. Uh, she was fearless in the studio. And not all of the paintings were uh, delicate in color. Uh, the one person who really got this was Frank O'Hara, who in his introductory essay for her uh, solo exhibition, her, her mini retrospective at the Jewish Museum, when she was uh, incredibly young for, for an artist of that generation, he's the one person who says, her work can be sullen, her work can be truculent, her work can be, she's not afraid to make it whatever it needs to be for the mood. No one else said that. And uh, I, I give uh, O'Hara full marks for that. She was enormously proud of what she called her darker paintings. Uh, she was enormously proud of what she called her darker palette. And uh, she, she knew she was a spectacular colorist. I mean, that was deeply ingrained in, in the way she worked. She couldn't help it. But she made a lot of paintings that were at the, using uh, colors that were not at the high chroma end of the spectrum. And in fact, she was so uh, tired of being always talked about as a wonderful colorist uh, that we worked on a show together that we called The Darker Palette. And it was enormous fun going around and, and finding these you know, black and dark brown and murky Frankenthalers, which had as much color in them as any of the chromatic paintings. But she wanted to be known that way. What's happening now, um, is, I think, very gratifying. She is, there were uh, artists of her uh, who were older than she was, uh, who were playing the I was a marginalized artist crowd, a card, who were, who were getting considerably more attention than, than she was for a while. Uh, that's not true anymore. I'm very happy about that, because I think she's better than most of them. Uh, what is happening is there seems to be an effort to reposition her as an abstract expressionist. Uh, the, uh, MoMA has put up a wonderful painting of hers called Jacob's Ladder, which was the first painting of hers that they acquired in 1957. It's a 57 painting. Uh, that's pretty impressive for someone who was born in December of 1928. A wonderful picture, hasn't been up in years. I'm thrilled it's up there. But it's in a room called Action Painting 2. They've gotten rid of any isms except surrealism. And uh, she's in there with Joan Mitchell, Grace Hardigan, Lee Krasner. There's a very nice Pavlov work on paper. I think the head of Stern is that, in that room. And one Pollock. I mean, what's that about? <laughs> Um, and there's a great deal of talk about Frankenthaler as an abstract expressionist, when in fact everything she did was showing people, including artists who were older than she was, a way out of the gestural, contingent, wet into wet kind of abstract expressionism. She led the way into something completely different. And uh, I cannot say often enough, Stop calling her an abstract expressionist. That whirling sound is Helen revolving. <laughs> um, 
related to what you were talking about earlier, uh, Frank O'Hara being her champion and so many others not being her champion. Uh, in your book, Colorist Fields, American Painting 1950 to 1975, there's an essay by Carl Belz in which he talks about Helen Frankenthaler's work. Specifically, there's a section in which he responds to Harold Rosenberg's negative review of her painting. And I'm gonna quote that negative review here in very brief. The artist is the medium of her medium. Her part is limited to selecting aesthetically acceptable colors from the partly accidental behavior of her color. To that and the rest of the negative criticism, Bell's response responds and we can hear his sarcasm. So, Franken Frankenthaler didn't grasp the metaphysics of action painting and her softness lacked objectivity. Not physical enough on the one hand, she was not rational enough on the other. Which meant in Bob Dylan's memorable sung words, she was just like a woman. <laughs> can you comment on the stereotypes and contradictory attributes women had to be juggled, had to juggle to be taken seriously and compete with their male peers, and, and particularly with regard to those kinds of reviews? Uh, we all miss Carl Belts for many reasons. Um, some of us think that um, Harold Rosenberg is a joke. And uh, the whole idea of action painting and the canvas as an arena for action, uh, if you read a very interesting article by Clement Greenberg called How, Abst How Art Writing Got Its Bad Name, he tells a story that was told to him by Jackson Pollock. On a drive with Harold Rosenberg out to Long Island, uh, Pollock invented this notion of action painting. And uh, Rosenberg bought it. And it has been uh, circulating ever since and is now enshrined in two galleries in MoMA. So uh, look, up, look up the piece, it's very entertaining. The uh, issue with Frankenthaler is exactly what I was talking about. People seeing uh, work that wasn't gestural, that you know, didn't have the heroic, uh, to say wet into wet contingent, every gesture is a declaration of my personality, and they misread it. They also did not understand that she wasn't simply pouring color onto canvas on the ground. Uh, there were some very interesting films of her working, and you see her down there, and yes, she starts by pouring the paint, but she's sponging out, she's adding, she's moving it around with her hands, she's, she is willing this sometimes. You wonder if she hasn't moved the paint by force of her personality. But the, she, she was not ex only accepting what was happening, she was reacting to what was happening. And it was not the model that um, certain critics thought was um, what was heroic. I mean, you know, she, <clears throat> she drank very little. Um, she was an uptown girl. Uh, yes, she, when she was involved with Helen Greenberg, she was downtown, she was part of the scene. Uh, but Helen always had a kind of reserve. Uh, she was not, like Joan Mitchell, going to be one of the boys. She was not, like Lee Krasner, going to make herself subservient to anybody to advance someone else's career. She was totally her own person, and she was doing this on her own terms. And however much a well-brought-up nice young lady from the Upper East Side she was, um, in the studio she was absolutely fearless, no holds barred. Uh, there's also been a lot of uh, recent very unpleasant writing about her, uh, mostly by um, Anna Chave. Uh, saying that she used her money and her social position to advance her art. Joan Mitchell's family had infinitely more money than Helen Frankenthaler's. No one seems to mind about that. And uh, one of the proofs that was offered of Helen's using her social position 
to advance her career was that she, when she was married to Bob Motherwell, they gave dinner parties. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> Next question is for Nancy Prinzenthal. Nancy, in two of your recent books, you raise the issue of identity, since that is also the topic for this evening, uh, the gendered lens and beyond it. So uh, that prompts a couple of questions. Uh, in Agnes Martin, Her Life and Art, you report that Martin did not identify as a woman artist. Indeed, she often did not identify as a woman at all. And you quote her as saying, art should not, shouldn't have a gender. I'm for keeping the field of art as it is, neither masculine nor feminine. But of course, art was a male world, and before the women's movement, female artists were navigating sexist waters without a sextant. How much of an outlier was Martin in terms of her attitude? Where along the spectrum did some of her peers register? Is, it, is this on? Yes. Um, complicated set of nested questions. Yeah. And um, I'll see if I can sort of tackle them in order. I'll probably leave some out. Um, but I, I think I want to first answer the question of whether her attitude made her an outlier. Um, and I, I think by being an outlier, you mean um, wanting her work to be seen as work rather than as work that's identified with a particular aspect of her character, her background, her, her place in the world. And I, you know, I think we've already heard um, you know, from Karen about Franklin Poller and from Emily about her own work that this notion of a feminine aesthetic is not one that actually gets much support on the ground. Um, outlier in terms of just straight ahead being seen as a woman, even if she didn't consider herself um, a woman in any simple way, yeah, it was a really, really tough time um, in the 60s. Uh, you know, worse in some ways, and the 60s, early 70s, I think, than it had been earlier. I think, you know, the wonderful um, sort of survey we've had of women in the early years of AA demonstrates that, you know, women had a had a, a, a better shot in the pre-war and, and wartime years than they did afterwards, which is all stuff that's been covered quite a bit in, um, in all sorts of women's um, landmark literature from, you know, Bovar and Betty Friedan on. Um, but, uh, you know, no question, Martin was an outlier in all sorts of ways. Uh, you know, she was an outlier geographically. She grew up in in um, rural Canada, Macklin, Saskatchewan, Vancouver. Um, she moved to nor the Northwest in her early adulthood, Northwest of the United States, Washington State. She spent 10 years, um, I'm sure all of you know this, this history, or some of you do, um, 10 years all together living in New York, and she didn't like it very much. Um, most of her <coughs> life, um, she um, spent in rural places, principally in New Mexico. So that made her an outlier. And of course, being a lesbian, being a closeted les lesbian, made it only tougher for her. Having schizophrenia made it tough for her. Um, so there are a lot of ways that she operated, at, you know, with aspects of her identity um, as a kind of obstacle. Maybe handicap is too harsh a word. Um, but she was also really, really adamant, and I think we've heard this already also, about that not being the point. Um, I, I also love the, the um, line that um, Emily used about abstraction not being any protection for women artists. It's, you know, clearly it's not. You know, women were seen as women, whether they were making abstract art or the most explicitly autobiographical figurative art. But Martin did see her work as transcending all of those conditions of her personal life and um, of her physical being. Um, she really believed not only that artists should all be treated equally, but that her work represented universal values. Um, that actually did make her something of an abstract expressionist, as I see it, that sort of commitment to these transcendent um, experiences of, of joy, of harmony, of serenity, of ecstasy. Um, 
that's what she was about. Um, but I also want to say, and this is further to the question of being an outlier, um, that despite her choices of where she lived and how she worked and how um, the conditions um, under which she set up her living and, and working um, circumstances, um, she really wanted to succeed. She didn't believe her art uh, was complete unless people were seeing it. She wanted a lot of people to see it. She wanted to be successful. Um, it wasn't principally a wish driven by material concern. She didn't care that much about money. She did like fancy cars, but that's about it. Um, she liked giving money away at the end of her life when she had a lot of it. Um, but it was really important to her that her work be taken seriously. And of course, one way of saying that is that it be considered alongside the most successful artists of her time, and those were mostly men. Nancy, continuing with you. Uh, in your most recent book, Unspeakable Acts, Women, Art, and Sexual Violence in the 1970s, you write, The fault lines that opened almost from the start in the feminist movement of the 1970s, prominently including race and gender identity, are hardly less divisive now than they were then. Indeed, the increasingly challenging question of what de defines a woman had not yet been raised. How has the full range of gender identity, including transgender men and women, influenced perceptions of female artists and perhaps female aesthetics? More easy questions. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, the, that question, the question of um, uh, considering the experiences of women who are subject to violence um, who aren't um, in a conventional position on the male to female spectrum, um, the whole notion of um, a non-binary understanding of gender um, was pretty foreign to um, artists and to society at large, to culture at large in the 1970s, which is where um, the book Unspeakable Acts really stakes it, it, it's, um, it's, ter it's, it's, it's where, I, um, where I start my exploration in that book. Um, and, um, of course, it, it quickly, in second wave feminism, and the feminism of um, the early and mid-1970s became very divisive. Um, as we all know about the history of, of the feminist movement in those years, um, women who weren't straight um, became, early on, quite irritated about the fact that they were being written out of, um, written out of the agenda. Um, we all know as well that there were racial divisions that um, were, were very harmful um, to the movement right from the beginning. And um, I think both of those kinds of divisions, the racial division and um, the, the straight gay division, were exasper exacerbated around the issue of sexual violence. Um, and I think that's particularly true of of race, um, and I, I think that's true because there's always been, there remains a horrific um, disproportion uh, in the um, rates at which men are accused, convicted, especially convicted, um, and um, incarcerated for um, sexual crimes, for um, crimes of rape and assault. And um, it's uh, the case for incarceration in general in this, in this country that way more black men than white men um, suffer from that fate. So it, you know, it became a very tough thing for, for African American women to get behind this idea that, that um, rape should be at the top of um, anyone's feminist agenda. Um, even if, if black and white women were going to get together on a feminist agenda, sexual violence was not going to be a primary concern. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, if we look past the 70s at work that's being made in response to um, sexual violence, uh, we see the kinds of um, diversity 
and, and um, openness to addressing difficult questions that were um, not possible for women at making the first, you know, kind of first ever um, performance works and, and also pictorial works that address sexual assault. This uh, next question is directed to all of you, so um, I hope we can get a nice overlapping uh, conversation going. Uh, in her book, Ninth Street Women, Mary Gabriel states, Art historians and philosophers have taught that one is unable to understand art deeply without understanding the time and place in which a work was created. The women artists working at mid-century were part of a rapidly changing political and social environment that encompassed the Great Depression and World War II. And then, of course, and I'm not quoting her now, uh, we had World War II to the beginning of the women's movement, and then the women's movement to now. So a, a lot of different societal situations. Broadly speaking, how did this social and political environment affect the activities and work of women artists? Um, Creighton, let's start with you, because you've spoken <laughs> on the history of, uh, uh, of the women in American abstract artists. So let's get your thoughts. But I'd like everyone to jump in and agree and disagree. It's okay. Wow. Um, I think what part of that question do you want to... I mean, that's a, there's a lot of things. Okay, let's, so let's talk about oh. between the Great Depression and World War II, which would be the time of the founding of, uh, of American abstract art. Well, I think that um, the biggest problem was uh, for people, for artists, male or female, and probably more for female, was to live, to be able to do your work, and to find a way to support that. Um, and when I, uh, uh, Bingle, Rosalind well, yeah, Rosalind Binglesworth Brown had to, the reason she had to quit painting was that she had to make a living. And she went back to school, became a writer and an educator, because according to the quote, only um, one, one painter in a, her family could exist. So I, I think that on a primal level, that is really where a lot of the, I mean, the idea, and, and you're looking at a time when the financial world, or the, or the economy, was extremely difficult. Had it not been for the WPA, um, a number of artists, especially abstract artists, would have not existed. And so I think that there are multiple, and then within that, and as you, you know, as things change, I mean, also the impact of, of uh, World War II, where there was a greater sense of uh, equality, let's say, between male and female because of necessity. Now, so I guess that sort of flips back after uh, in the post-war time, and we kind of go back to start again. But um, um, I mean, I, I, that's that is such a wide-ranging, multi-layered kind of. Um, question and, uh, and time, and I think in the time we have, I don't know we could really, other than just kind of go over the, kind of the simplest parts of that. Well, you made a good start, so <laughs> let's, let's keep this engine moving. Okay. That's good, thank you. Um, Rebecca, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, so I, I think Creighton made an interesting point in kind of the aftermath of the Great Depression and World War II. There was kind of, in the 1930s, this almost perceived sort of equality that people thought they had reached. I think because you had organizations like uh, the WPA where women artists were working alongside their, their male counterparts and they were receiving equal pay. And so there was kind of a sense that there wasn't really a necessity to, to engage in these sorts of conversations. And then you had 
And then, of course, returning to war, and you had, uh, uh, returning from war, you had uh, European um, refugee artists who were coming, and you had the Surrealists who were notoriously uh, masochistic, and that they have anecdotes of, you know, dressing their wives up in ridiculous outfits and makeup and having contests of who could dress and adorn their wives the best. And so you, you had this kind of permeating um, masochism that really started to inch its way into the art world. And I think looking specifically at what was going on with abstraction, um, abstraction is not something that's inherently easy to understand. And so after all these the Great Depression and World War II, uh, America really wanted something that was very clear and had a very clear political agenda. And so if you're looking at it from the perspective of women in, in abstraction, and I think this is one of the unifying forces with American abstract artists is that um, abstraction and women were on that, uh, the, were outsiders essentially together. Um, they weren't accepted by American society because they weren't easy to understand because they were uh, too new. They didn't meet the standards of their European predecessors. predecessors. They didn't kind of have the tradition behind them. And so I think this is one of the really big reasons why from the inception of AAA, women have been you know, such an integral part of this organization because they were working towards this uh, mutual goal of advocating for abstraction. Virginia? Um, yeah, I think just to build on that, uh, thinking about a couple of the artists um, that are included in our show at the BMA, Irene Rice Pereira is an interesting example to think about in this context because, you know, she's someone who, on one hand, would sign her paintings just with her first initial, right, I Rice Pereira, so you wouldn't necessarily know that she was a woman artist. Um, but she also helped found the Design Laboratory School here in New York, which was a WPA-founded program that was built on the Bauhaus model in the late 1930s, and that was, um, you know, an opportunity for her, thinking about it from an institutional framework, to reach out to peers and colleagues in the field, she was corresponding with scientists and manufacturers, because she was very interested in learning about new materials, and, um, you know, sort of thinking about media for painting, she was working on glass, she was working with corrugated plexiglass, and so she was, you know, in correspondence with presumably many male counterparts across the country, um, but then when that funding, when the WPA funding ended in 1939, the school closed down, that avenue closed down, right? Um, also thinking about it from a local or regional level, also, I think that's a really important framework uh, for women artists who didn't have the opportunities to exhibit uh, their work. You had regional institutions that were founded, like the Municipal Art Society is one in Baltimore that began um, and really played a fundamental role in terms of providing an exhibition space for women artists to get together and to show their work, right? Much again like the place that we find ourselves in tonight. Oh, and I'm sorry, I also neglected to address your earlier question about female identifying artists. So I'm gonna loop around for a second and just tackle that one um, briefly. And I think that, well, the, the idea of gender as a spectrum, right, came up um, earlier. And I think that's exactly right, that in this day and age, we become more and more aware of gender expression as existing on a spectrum. And so when you make a claim to women artists, what does that mean? Uh, we need to be cognizant of that a little bit. Um, and so uh, women, I, you know, artists who identify as female is a category that we are, an aspect of that categorization uh, that we wanted to engage with in terms of recognizing that gender exists on a spectrum and can be manifest in very different ways. So in our day and age, when it really behooves us to take an intersectional approach to thinking about identity, that was, that is a, it's the challenge, right? In, in staking a claim in an era in which we recognize the structural obstacles that women artists have faced, but we also want to be cognizant about being inclusive in our inclusivity. Um, so I hope that helps answer your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. There, there's another uh, aspect that we haven't talked about, and it's the proverbial 800-pound elephant in the room. And that is some of this uh, restriction and marginalization was self-imposed. 
I mean, there was, there was not the kind of uh, expectation among even extremely talented and ambitious women who were making art that they were going to forge ahead uh, the way their male counterparts would be. You mentioned Judith Rothschild, who was uh, one of Hoffman's most gifted students and started exhibiting wonderful paintings with Jane Street. Uh, she then married a writer who thought that uh, New York was evil and corrupt and stultifying to creativity. And he carried her off very willingly to Monterey, California, which was not exactly a hotbed of creativity. <laughs> you know, Cannery Row, it was mostly about fish. Um, <laughs> And uh, they lived there for quite a while. Um, her family made, some, made furniture. It wasn't Ethan Allen, but it was something like that. She was, she was extremely wealthy. Um, he lived very happily on her avails. Uh, they would go off to Provincetown every summer, where she uh, fell under the spell of Karl Knaths, not one of our more distinguished painters. And her work, which had been so exciting and so promising, just uh, then he ran off with his literary agent, and she decided maybe she shouldn't stay in Monterey, but she came back to New York where she reconnected with her friends, who included Robert Motherwell, and other people who encouraged her to get back on track, and her late work was really, really exciting. But there was this long period when she was perfectly happy to be uh, married to this guy who, uh, they were living on her money, and uh, she was not exhibiting, she was not making work with the ambition she was capable of. And there are countless stories like that. Pat Paslow, um, very, very daring in the studio, so subservient to her husband, Milton Resnick, that when I congratulated her when she was in her 60s on getting a Guggenheim, she said, it should have been Milton. <laughs> Not a nice <laughs> Very beautiful show that you curated at the uh, Resnick Paslaw Foundation. Virginia, did you want to add something there? Nancy, what would you like to add? Or uh, yeah, the, the, uh, what we're talking about are the circumstances uh, of the time. Uh, whether they were financial or uh, societal, whether they had to do with sexual politics or, you know, just simply poverty, uh, the war, all of the things that were going on from, from um, uh, pre-war, then post-war, then the women's movement to now. Uh, how did all of those kinds of things, uh, situations, affect women artists. Big, big topic, so just pick something, <laughs> anyway. pick anything. I, think I, I thought that's what it was. Yes. And I actually kind of want you to go at it quickly from a slightly different direction, which is that, you know, in, in, in my life, in, in the art world, in my life as a writer, um, it has begun to seem that the place where, where I entered, um, which is probably true for a number of us on the panel and in, in the room, you know, that, the, um, the 1970s was sort of the heyday of the belief that you could eliminate social, social, social circumstances, you could eliminate, eliminate biography, you could eliminate anything um, in the interest of getting at the truth of the work you were addressing, which was of course, you know, great big minimalist work made by men. And um, it, you know, it now looks like a very strange proposition because when you go back to the earlier years of abstraction, for instance, there was an understanding that um, spiritualism, for instance, which is something that's gotten some renewed attention lately, was absolutely fundamental to the creation and the experience of um, the kind of work that Kandinsky or Mondrian or, um, uh, um, sorry, names. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Etc. is the name I'm looking for. <laughs> so, uh, so this, you know, of 
course, all of us in, in whatever walk of life, but artists most particularly, because artists do tend to live in a more precarious way, are hugely affected by the social and economic and political circumstances of their time, as well as, of course, by their biography, by their um, spiritual inclinations. Um, so it, to, I, I think it's a great relief in some ways that we're able now to um, embrace the full spectrum of these concerns when we're trying to um, talk about work and, and um, to understand from an artist's perspective um, what's going on, what's being made. Would anyone like to add to any of that? I've got a question for you, Emily, but feel free to, to no. jump in there. Um, your, your anecdote about being in art school and having to deal with that kind of sexism, even by a really nice teacher, is one that I bet almost everyone, every woman in this room has experienced. And, and actually, when we get to some q and I'd, I'd love to hear some of those stories if you're willing to share. Um, I'm wondering how, how much of that kind of attitude affected you into your early career as an artist. I mean, it's horrible stuff that was laid on women. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, for one thing, I can't, I can't remember. But for another... <laughs> Um, you know, I think that we, I think that um, you looked for people who would be supportive. That's what I did. I mean, I, I ignored a lot of what people said to me. I was very protective of my work. I sought out, I seem to be pretty good at seeking out and finding people like uh, Marvin Brown when I was in college, uh, who was my advisor um, and is an AAA member. Um, like when I went to grad school, I sought out Jenny Snyder, who was teaching undergrads at the time. Um, I, you know, you, I befriended other women painters, particularly. Um, and I think that, you know, you make community where you can. And um, there was certainly um, plenty of support uh, to be found. And, and I, I, I mean, I guess if I had advice for younger artists, if they were suffering that sort of thing, that's what I would tell them to do. I don't know what else you can do. I mean, other than organizing. I mean, things have changed. I don't think, I don't think, I mean, I don't, I'm sure a lot of the male professors can't get away with what they could get away with then. Yeah. <laughs> Where would women artists be now without the women's movement? Same place. <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> where, would, where would the women's movement be without artists? <laughs> There's some synergy there. Yeah. Would anyone else like to respond to that question? Um, what have we not discussed that you think is important to bring up in the context of the gendered lens and looking beyond the gendered lens. There's something I, I this is also going to be me trying to um, recover a, a dropped part of the question um, that you asked. And um, it, it has to do with something that's, um, I, I think, sort of very much abroad in the land of, of um, contemporary abstraction. It has to do with touch and craft. And um, it's another way of getting at um, what has been described and then dismissed as a feminist aesthetic. 
And um, in relationship, for instance, to Agnes Martin, it's the, it's the question that always comes up about the relationship between her work and, say, textiles. Mm -hmm. And of course, she was identified as making feminine kinds of grids because they were like um, woven cloth, which is an analogy that wouldn't necessarily be made to, say, Solomon's grids or Bryce Martin's grids or um, other um, artists of the era making grids. And, you know, it, it made Martin absolutely incensed to have those kind of connections drawn, even though she was quite close, of course, to Lenore Tawney, who, uh, with, they named each other's art, they, um, they influenced each other a great deal. Um, so, uh, you know, I want to say that I think um, that too is a, a misattribution, that, that, you know, craft is something that doesn't belong to men or women. Um, hand, handmadeness is, um, is not a gendered attribute. Um, and, but I do think that it's worth thinking about um, the relationship in, in this moment between Whitney just opening a huge show dedicated to you know, the made object, the craft, um, what feminism has contributed to making that embrace possible. Yeah, um, I think the, the most interesting thing for me is the beyond part. Um, because as has been said uh, many times by all of us, uh, the artists that we've been thinking about and interested in have never described themselves as women artists any more than their male counterparts describe themselves as men artists. I mean, maybe that should start happening. It might clarify a bit. Uh, but there, there are so many difficult questions. I mean, do you do you want to be included in something because you're good at it, or do you want to be included because you fulfill certain categories? Mm -hmm. And that's a very uncomfortable question when you are trying to regress imbalances. And unfortunately, it's a question that comes to mind, and it, it definitely comes to mind in, for example, the installation at the New Museum of Modern Art. You start wondering about why certain choices were made. But what you were saying about the textile um, reminded me of something I've, I've forgotten for years. Um, it was an artist who will remain nameless, who's quite well known as a, a public feminist. And she was talking about her work. And she said, and then I decided to express my femininity by working with traditional women's techniques like stitchery. And I thought, well, what difference does it make what you're using? I mean, we're all of us bringing all of our own baggage, everything, as you said, which has shaped us, the artist, to, to what we're looking at. The artist is loading whatever he or she is making with all of his or her baggage. Um, you can't ignore it, but you also can't avoid it. And I, I was, I've never forgotten this. This is about 25 years ago, and I thought, is, what do you mean this is how you express your femininity? You're a female person making work right now. As far as I know, you've never been anything other than a female person. So everything you make is going to be informed by that, whether it's made of clay or steel or stitchery. Would anyone else like to add to that comment or um, express Anything else that you're thinking about with regard to gender lens or, be, or going beyond it? Okay, on that note, we turn to you. Um, Let me just say. Yes. At this point in the evening, we are. We're going to take questions from the audience for, for our panel. I want to thank everybody up here. I personally thought it was fascinating. Thank you. I also want to thank, which I forgot to do before, my fellow events committee members, Karen Schifano, who worked <laughs> so for this question.
Terry and Tierra. So at this point, we'll, I return to you in the audience. Um, if there's something that, that you would like to ask one of our panelists, uh, we'll come around with the microphone. Don't be shy. Just raise your hand if you have a question. Don't be intimidated. Come on. Or a comment. <laughs> Okay, hold on. Adrian. Hi, um, I'd like a little more elucidation perhaps on the concept or question of participating in a show because you belong there or because you qualify for some category, such as gender, for example. <coughs> Because there has been so much discussion recently about uh, museum staffs, uh, about exhibitions, which do not represent that magical, all-encompassing word, diversity, uh, we, there are, we, we've seen it. Um, exhibitions of artists who seem to be fulfilling certain requirements. Uh, our mayor has said that unless uh, museum staffs reflect the uh, makeup of the city, uh, we're not going to qualify for money. And that has meant a kind of scramble for uh, hiring people. Uh, one assumes they are, they are good at what they do, and, and it's great that they're uh, getting these jobs, uh, but we hope that they're being hired because they're great at what they do. Uh, so it's, it's obviously the pendulum, you know, is going to have to swing one way before it can swing the other way. But there are questions that come to mind. They're not pretty, uh, but it's part of the reality. And um, one, one does hope that people are included because of the excellence of their work or the excellence of their curatorial ability, and not because somebody said, well, if you don't hire somebody who comes from that background, we're not going to fund it. Rebecca, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I think um, a lot of the importance of your question, too, is or uh, what we thought about in organizing this exhibition is that it, it wasn't supposed to just be a show about women. I mean, that was never the organizing principle was to be this is a show about women artists. That was almost secondary in the thought process of this is a show about abstraction. It is about the female members, and it's about celebrating uh, women who might be underrepresented or not recognized in the mainstream because they haven't been part of these conversations, but it is ultimately to show um, kind of the, the nature of abstraction and, you know, one of the most brilliant points I like about the show is it kind of shows the timelessness of abstraction in a way that it's it's almost hard to date when you put these pieces in conversation next to each other. I mean, with I think with the exception of Slobodkina, who is very constructivist in her piece here, um, you can put a Pearl Fine next to, um, you know, a Lynn Harlow or a Vera Vasek. And um, I think it's it's interesting that the conversations that come out of these kinds of things. And so I think it's, it's very important if you're organizing a show that has these kinds of very uh, loaded political social statements that it, it does eventually it does come back to the art you know there it is in its essence all about the artwork and the artist thank you um, yeah I would just add to that I think it's such a great question um, you know and that balance for really thinking about artistic excellence is so important um, I mean, I have to say, I have to think about the Judy Chicago essay in which she describes, right, studying art in the year 2000. Um, it's a fact that which she wrote in 1975. And it's kind of hysterical, right? You read it, I would teach it to my students, and it's about, you know, how we will all be studying these the works of these women artists, and that's it, and it will be, you know, um, not so much a history as an history. Um, and now, in this day and age, we know how far we have to come, and that we'll never actually get there. Really, um, and we have to be aware of the structural obstacles that women artists have faced in terms of access to education, 
and training and exposure and critical reception, um, there is still work to be done. So, you know, we will, we might for now still be having exhibitions that are focused on women artists with the hope, perhaps the fantasy, that 20, 30, 50 years from now, you know, my future students will say, or my children or my grandchildren will say, God, that was such a stupid thing to do. Why did you do that? You know, why, why on earth would you ever focus on just women artists? That's so discriminatory. Um, you know, whatever it might be, right? We have to, that, that frame, that lens, we, we just don't know. So we have to do the work that we can do now in the hopes that it'll be obsolete in the future. Hopefully, of course, but by then, the heterosexual white male might be the minority who's been marching up on that. But um, <laughs> apropos of Judy Chicago, um, you know, of course, that she reduced Emily Dickinson in the dinner party to a set of sexual references on a plate. Um, all of them. <laughs> and I think, you know, that, that essentializing factor, right, is yeah. something to be mindful of. Let's take another question. Um, Orion. Hi. Um, one thing that I haven't heard addressed, and also I just started Ninth Street Women, so I don't know if this is addressed, but I'm wondering about how um, women as a sort of repress or oppressed or underdog cohort, how much women artists historically and now are supporting each other versus being competitive and sort of hoarding resources. Who would like to I kind of identify with that anecdote in particular because I had um, a similar experience happen to me when I first graduated and this was one of my first interviews in the real world um, at a, a big, you know, blue chip New York gallery and uh, was interviewed um, by a woman and through the course of the interview she eventually asked, you know, how did you get this interview? And from what I inferred from the tone and the idea behind the question was uh, you don't have the experience or the authority to interview for this kind of position. And I felt very demeaned, uh, you, you know, uh, belittled by that statement and, you know, in the course of looking back I remember looking her up and she came from this, a very similar uh, art historical background as me, but I think that it's interesting that, you know, I come from the perspective of you are up the ladder and you turn around and you help the next person up. And I think that those small moments of experience are very enlightening and a, a moment of realization for you to hopefully never do that to another person. Um, but overall, I think it's very important, like Emily talked about earlier, to find mentors and to find communities and people who are going to support you and lift you up in um, moments because everyone will have them when you don't necessarily necessarily feel like you have the authority or the um, inclusiveness to belong or to be part of that conversation. Thank you. Would anyone else like to add to that, Nancy? I think so because I, I think it's very much connected to the previous question about opportunities. <clears throat> and um, like I just said, I think that um, the problem is seeing um, any of this as a zero-sum game. Uh, you know, I think it's conceivable, I can sort of believe this, this is also anecdotal, that, um, that the possibility of being generous um, has increased, uh, you know, over the past couple of decades and more. Um, maybe it's just something you figure out as you go along that being generous actually is better for your own career enhancement than being selfish. You know, it's something that I think at some point we all sort of get. It doesn't really help you to, you know, help, you know hold on to your, uh, you know, little sort of handful of privilege. Um, spreading it around um, does tend to sort of increase the wealth for everyone. But, uh, you know, going back, and uh, sorry, I do want to go back just for a moment yes, to this please. question of um, whether um, exhibitions are being organized to fill categories. Um, you know, I have found that being encouraged, as we all have been over the past 10, 15, 20 years and more, 
um, to be more alert to um, deficiencies in who is being represented under what circumstances has only enhanced my um, understanding of some, you know, I mean, this goes back to Linda Knocklin. It's not a problem with, you know, whether or not women are making good art, it's whether or not institutions are supporting them. And the same is true for um, people who have been marginalized in every category. And um, there too, being generous is um, something that enhances, I think. I have a question. Um, yeah. Wait. When you were speaking about Helen Frankenthaler and how they wanted to categorize her as an abstract expressionist, which was clearly very much a male type of male aesthetic at that time, how does, do you feel about women's aesthetics and um, had things that are identified as female, how do, and in terms of craft and things being handmade, how do you think that is, has changed the, um, the aesthetics of the art world?
need to leave. So we're going to allow them. <laughs> <laughs>